Um, welcome back, everyone. I hope you all had good little breaks and lunches and snacks or coffees, whatever you did. Um, so I'm really excited to um, introduce my dear friend, Dana Danger, uh, who's going to be moderating this panel that's about art and futurisms and amazing, amazing things. Um, so Dana Danger is a two-spirit queer Métis Soto Polish visual artist raised in so-called Winnipeg, Manitoba. Using photography, sculpture, performance, and video, Danger's practice questions the line between empowerment and the objectification by claiming space with her large, uh, larger-than-life scale work. Uh, so everybody, if we could just take a moment to welcome this amazing panel. Got grounded. <laughs> you got grounded. <laughs> um, cool. Ani Dana Danger Indigenous Cause Wabishke Mokwa Ninto Dem Winnipeg Manitoba Ninjaba. Hi everyone. My name is Dana Danger. I'm originally based. Uh, was originally raised in so-called Winnipeg Manitoba Treaty One territory, um, but I'm so living in uh, so-called Montreal now or Jojage. The, the land of the Ganegehaga, the people of the Flint. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. Um, thank you so much for um, taking the time to do that uh, grounding with me. Um, I find sometimes these spaces can be very daunting uh, for some of us or feel kind of out of place or not right. And if we're gonna talk about decolonial practices or whatever, like if your spirit tells you to sing, then you sing. You know, you need to do that. Otherwise, um, doesn't you don't feel you don't feel good. You don't feel good in the same ways, and that's like that's a way to kind of like honor yourself. Um, yeah. So I'm really um, honored and grateful to be in this territory again, uh, to be welcomed here in such a beautiful way. And it's so amazing to see so many folks from so many different parts of this 
uh, world, all these connections between these um, the, the lands and the oceans. And I'm just very excited to kind of introduce you all. Um, oh yeah, and also uh, the song is uh, called the grandfather song, uh, Seven Grandfather Song. Um, and this was taught to me by Natka Bertrand, who's a, a, who I sing with in this group called Odaya. And we're a group of folks um, that kind of, uh, I hate to say, to say traditional and contemporary, but like we know, we know ceremonial songs, we know kind of more public songs, and we, we just get together and sing. Um, and so Emily Monet and Patty Shaughnessy taught us uh, that song. Uh, so it's always really good to say when you're singing songs, where they come from and who gave them to you, as we witnessed before, because um, it's kind of like the, the indigenous copyright. Um, and you're also recognizing ancestors and people because those songs come from us. Uh, and you know, and those are, those are things that we share with other uh, folks. Um, in this space. And then there's some things that we don't share, so, you know. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce y'all, so. Okay, so Chantal Fraser is a Brisbane-based interdisciplinary artist of Samoan ancestry. The artist is interested in the connection between adornment and the silhouette, and her work subverts perpetual cultural and anthropological interpretations often cast onto objects made by artists of indigenous ancestry. Um, Christopher Ando is an Alutic Hungarian and Norwegian artist, musician, and composer currently based in Oakland, California. Ando um, examines the implications and ambiguity, ambiguities of documentation within the converging realms of history, of history and identity through wood carving, painting, sound, and collage. Rakan Hanus. Cor um, Corlett is an interdisciplinary artist from the Wicano and uh, Kalus uh, nations. His artistic practice is continually shifting between mediums, eschewing commodification in favor of the processes that are collaborative and often ephemeral or experiment uh, experiential, um, such as mural painting and audiovisual performance. Okay, so. Um, Hannah, is it Bront or Bronte? Bronte. Bronte <laughs> is a Brisbane-based artist with cultural connections to Waka Waka, uh, Wagle, and, um, and the Welsh. Her practice focuses on female and indigenous empowerment through collaborative projects that support community via mediums of performance, video, photography, and textiles. Last but not least, Wes Harmon um, uses they, them pronouns and is a uh, carrier uh, with that mixed race, trans, FTN, indigiqueer. Harmon works across print, illustration, beading, and text, usually utilizing DIY strategies around punk aesthetics to discuss urban indigenous identity, resistance, and visibility. So let's give a round of applause for these amazing artists. <laughs> I mean, I'm really excited about this discussion because I think for um, for many indigenous peoples right now, it's like really at the forefront of our minds, which is um, we're really thinking about like these urgent imaginations, these indigenous futurisms, you know, and to kind of like ground this more in this moment, I'd really like to take the time for each artist to kind of like say who they are because maybe, um, you've never heard of these uh, brilliant people before. And so I wanna give them a time to speak about themselves, introduce themselves, and talk about themselves and their practice. So um, I think on the slide, you're first, Bracken, so it's you, boo. Also, you can like, look right here. Okay. <laughs> <So you can. laughs> mic check, mic check, okay. Uh, Yes, yeah, so how long do I speak for? Like 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay, right on. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, my name is Bracken Hanus Corlett. Uh, I come from the Awikino and Klahus nations, as well as the Slaman and uh, Guasala Nakwadakh. Um, been working as an artist for about almost 20 years now, which is pretty wild. <laughs> I started in theater and then 
uh, after working in theater, I was actually mainly a technician. And I worked on a lot of indigenous productions and I uh, saw like the collaborative element of theater. And I really, I think my practice has really gravitated towards collaboration uh, because of that experience in theater. Uh, but after working in theater, I, like I, as a technician, I realized like I wasn't really fulfilling myself as, a, as an artist. And so I went to art school, uh, initially at the Anaukin Center of Indigenous Art in Penticton, BC. So I went there for two years and then transferred to UBCO and then transferred to Emily Carr. And yeah, went through all the institutional stuff at, at our school. I wouldn't really consider myself um, an academic by any means. Uh, I like to read and write, but that's about it. Uh, my work has been placed, I think, in this category of indigenous futurisms. And I've done some reading, I think, like around the subject. And I haven't always felt like my work uh, completely fits in with that, not all of it anyways. Um, I think initially when I started my journey in visual arts, I, my, the main focus for me was um, displacement. If we could just go back to that one, that, yeah. or the first one. The, the very first one? The, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so my family was di displaced uh, through the residential school process. Uh, my mom, she has uh, 13 brothers and sisters, and they were all moved across, across the map around BC. And um, I always kind of wondered why I grew up away from home. And uh, so basically, a big part of my process and journey has been to uh, reconnect with these ancestral lands that I'm from. And all of them, all the places that I'm from have uh, different histories of displacement, dispossession, disconnection. And uh, so a big part of my work uh, earlier on was exploring that, what that displacement meant. And so this picture here is actually, uh, it's a pictograph in a week ago on Round Mountain. And about 13 years ago, I was hired by my nation in a week ago to mainly film grizzly bears. Um, but we, we were lucky enough to actually hike around the land a lot and see some of these pictograph sites and petroglyph sites. And I'm not sure why, but um, it really like initiated a spark in me to, uh, to to learn like to learn this visual language, I guess, and and uh, learn more about what this visual language means as an Awakenoch or Klahus person. Uh, so yeah, I can flip forward, I guess. Yeah, I'll, I'll just move to the current work, I guess, that is at the the VAG. Uh, uh, Tara Hogue, the, one of the curators for the show, uh, approached me. I guess it was like two years ago, maybe and was like, do you want to do this show in Brisbane? And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> but I didn't really, I wasn't sure what I wanted to, to do right away. Uh, but my uncle Dennis had asked me to uh, basically recreate our family's crest. Uh, so you can see it uh, there. That's actually in the Airbnb at Bris in Brisbane uh, before, <laughs> before delivering the blanket to the gallery. Uh, I got into Brisbane and I didn't know, I've never really buttoned a blanket before and didn't realize how intense the labor process is. So I arrived with like a somewhat not completed blanket, very not completed blanket. <laughs> 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 and uh, spent most of the first five days just in the Airbnb while everybody else was able to kind of check, check things out. Uh, but yeah, so my Uncle Dennis asked me to recreate this and I asked him if there was any like visual sample of it. and. Uh, the thing about in a week, you know, all of our, all of our historical regalia, uh, all of our sacred items were either stolen. Um, there was a point in the '90s where there was a, a shed that had like basically the last remnants of our older work, and somebody set it on fire. Uh, so there's not a lot of even photographic or just like uh, uh, items in the community that you can really look at. So a big part of this was going to museums and searching for work that was specifically from my nations and going to pot latches and seeing, and talking to other people who had made button blankets with a Thunderbird design or a Kulus design. So uh, I'll just briefly talk about, I guess, what's on the blanket and then pass the mic. Uh, that's the Kulus, the, the main bird there you see in the middle. And then... Uh, <laughs> And then on the bottom is uh, the sea seal, which is a double-headed sea serpent. 
And which, which makes this unique to our family is uh, there's a little, there's an egg on top of the Kulus' head. And so my uncle told me that that signifies basically our family's uh, responsibility to look out for others in the community, especially vulnerable people or people that need help. And yeah, I think, is that good? <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I at my limit now? Um, well, I mean, like, if, uh, like, honestly, if you guys do want to have more time to speak to your practice, because I think it is, like, it is important for um, for us to hear, because I know that there's more slides, too, okay, yeah. and I think ultimately we can spend, a, I think it's better, actually, to spend a bit more time um, okay. on your practices so that we, yeah, yeah, we know where you guys are coming from. I'm just from. bad at time yeah. management. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, if we could yeah, flip to the... Do it work? Okay. So um, I'm not sure if everybody went to the, see the exhibition yet, but um, this is actually not fully from the animation, but it's, a, it's one of the designs I made uh, that was eventually put into the animation that's on the back of the blanket. So uh, for me, I've been working in animation, I guess, for the last five or six years, uh, mainly as a writer, but also uh, doing some, some of the illustrative works that eventually get moved around. And uh, so on the back of the blanket, it's basically activated by this uh, short animation that speaks to um, the Kulus, which the Kulus is that bird that was on the back. And one aspect of the Kulus is that it's a transformer who, uh, when it gets hot, uh, shakes its feathers off and becomes human. So when this dance is performed in the big house, you'll often see um, the dancer will have uh, the Kulu's mask on, and then lots of feathers or, or eagle down is uh, being spread across the dance floor. And so it's a, I think it's actually also a trait in our family that we get really hot and sweaty. <laughs> We're always running hot. I'm really sweaty right now. I'm hot right now. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if that we retain those physical qualities, but um, maybe you can flip to the last one. Or is that the last one? I think that's the last one. Yeah. So basically, yeah, when you go into the exhibition, you can see the blanket in the front and then walk around to the back. And, and yeah, and so that picture is from Brisbane. Also, um, I did add some buttons to, to this show and changed around the border. And I felt weird about that. Like maybe it, I hadn't finished the piece for the show in Australia, but. Um, talking to some aunties and stuff, they're like, you know, you always actually, when you get a blanket back from a potlatch, you, you'll add shells to it or you'll add, uh, maybe you'll, you'll learn a story and you add that to the border, so, so it's covered. And then maybe the last, the last one. So um, the Seussilth, which is the bottom figure uh, on, our, on our crest is actually, um, has actually been really an important, um, teacher for me too. Uh, the the sea seal uh, really represents the, the balance that we all have and um, the choice that we all have, I guess, to, to uh, choose uh, love or to, to choose hate, to choose to be creative or to choose to destroy, uh, to choose to tell the truth or to lie. And so this, this figure really represents that choice. And there's lots of stories where basically you'll be confronted by this figure and it will know what choice you make <laughs> in life. So, uh, so for me, it's when I see the sea silt, it really reminds me to, to actually choose love over hate and to, to choose, uh, you know, to speaking the truth. Um, yeah. My name is Wes Harmon. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I'm from the Carrier Watat Nation up north in BC. I wish I'd thought about this slideshow a bit more, because usually I show a picture of where I'm from, because it's sort of just like, oh, you're from the north. How north? And I'm like, not, not real north. It's like north for Vancouver. <laughs> uh, Smithers. Uh, is kind of where I went to high school, um, and our reserve land is Fort Babine, which is a part of a larger amalgamated group under Lake Babine Nation. Uh, but Kerry Watat refers to the settlement name that we have, uh, which is Watat Neke, which translates to the, the place of dried fish, um, if you're being humble. 
<laughs> and if you're being a little more uh, showing off, it's the capital of dried fish. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it really depends on your feeling that day. Um, I will say our fish is amazing. Um, and kind of maybe a good lead in to talk about some of my work. Uh, the salmon run in my community was really shitty this year. Uh, we got, we were expecting 400,000 fish to come through our count, and we got 40,000. So thinking about the future in terms of my family and where I come from and what's important to me, it's, there's a really very real and immediate um, effect on my community. And uh, making art for me is, feels kind of like a paltry way to contribute in many ways, but it does give me opportunities to talk to larger groups like this. Um, just talking a little bit more about the realities that many indigenous communities face, uh, particularly communities like mine that are very, like we have a lot of struggles and things like having a consistent salmon run really makes a difference for the winters for people. Um, it's no joke, it's an hour and a half drive in the town. Um, it's a really dangerous road, uh, just a lot of factors that happen. Um, talking about my community, I've been in Vancouver for about 10 years, give or take. Um, I moved here just after the Olympics, and moving to Vancouver was really strange. Uh, to be so far from my community, I'm the only person still from my family that lives down here. Um, but they're always very close to me, and I travel, I go back home, back and forth quite a lot. Um, not as much as I'd like to, and uh, again, the resource thing can be kind of weird. It's like you expect to go out for this, you know, ride out to go see this pictograph, and then your ride falls through, or the boat floods, or who knows what. <clears throat> um, but uh, my community's a place that's situated that we're not on the coast and we're not in the plains. Uh, we're very much a trades community and a lot of our regalia, and again, I wish I had thought to put a picture of our regalia in, um, really reflects that. Um, there's a lot of embellishment. Uh, there's, I feel like we're kind of like crows. Like we see something we like and we're just like, all right, I'm putting that on my blanket. <laughs> um, there's a lot of, <laughs> my favorite one is this like amazing, uh, someone from the bear clan, so my grandfather's clan, and it's just this completely sequined grizzly bear, and it's, it's gorgeous. And then there's like neon piping all along the bottom. It's, it's just an extravaganza of materials. Um, so I think kind of subconsciously, I ended up making a lot of these, or not a lot, they take a lot of time, but um, these jackets, um, it's from a series I call Potlatch Punk, and it's been ongoing for five years now. It is the slowest <laughs> thing I have ever done in my life. Um, and a lot of that just has to do with like the time that it takes to invest in these types of practices, and uh, just thinking about um, when something's done and when something's not. Bracken, when you said your uh, blanket hadn't been done, I'm like, it, it, it told you when it was done. You're fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, yeah, being able to bring these, uh, they're wearable pieces and I do wear them sometimes. And uh, I think that's kind of the joy of making them is like they bring this visibility. Um, they are also the project I find that gets the most attention because it is easy to attach to these idea of futurisms. Um, but I do a lot of other stuff as well. Uh, yes. So uh, my friend Cole Pauls, who's a uh, Taltan artist based here in Vancouver as well, does a series called, a comic series called Dakota Warriors, and it's a incredible um, comic that just got collected into a volume. It's, it has, I'm sorry, I'm really fixating on the laser Sasquatch character, <laughs> which is my favorite and also I cried about. Um, but yeah, so uh, kinship and like ideas of futurisms, uh, especially in comics and self-publishing, has been something that I've connected with other people a lot over. Uh, this is a pinup that I did for for the collected volume. So if you pick it up, you'll see it in there with Gord Hill and um, <laughs> sorry, hi Teresa. Teresa's beating over there and also has a piece in this comic book. <laughs> um, now she's hiding. <laughs> um, yeah, like futurisms 
I feel like it's something that we unconsciously do. I don't know if I'd say something like, I'm an indigenous futurist, um, but we think about going forward a lot, and I think that's just a natural progression. Um, and we're finally being able to look at that with a little bit more joy and a little bit more freedom to think past just surviving. Um, and that's been, it's been really important for me. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so this is from my favorite project that I never have any time to do. Um, I draw a comic called Cry Boy. It's about queer indigenous folk in the future. And basically the, what's happening in the comic is there are a bunch of <laughs> sad monsters and spirits that are surfacing around the territories of this uh, flooded kind of world that the characters live in. And um, the idea is that it's all the all these monsters and spirits are manifestations of things that previous generations didn't have time to resolve. Um, someone, one of my friends described it as pastel goth. I was like, yeah, I'm into it. <laughs> um, yeah, the first monster in the comic that's introduced is this creature that wanders around the bay crying. And at first people are sort of like, what is it doing here? Is it here to hurt us? And it's just sort of, they realize it's kind of pathetic and it just sort of wanders off. Um, I only have the first issue of it drawn so far, but hopefully for Van Calf, there will be two new ones. Um, it's funny, this jacket, someone messaged me about it this morning and it was kind of this really humbling, amazing thing and I feel bad because I haven't had time to message them back yet, but there's an exhibition that's going to be happening down in, I think, Arizona, they said, um, and they asked if they were allowed to name the exhibition after this jacket. And I was just like, holy man, like, I don't know, I make these things and like they're very personal and very important to me and I love holding them and I love touching them and spending time with them. Um, <laughs> that sounds really sensual. <laughs> <laughs> In some degree, I guess it kind of is. Um, but they, they are these objects, like creating these types of objects really helps you connect to other people um, and in a ways that you can be excited about. So, Wes, what does it yeah. say? It says, tell me about first contact. Um, my sister and I really love sci-fi stories and fantasy stories, but it's kind of this awkward thing because at the core of them, you always realize like, oh, this story about invaders coming to your land and taking over and wanting to fight back, that sounds really familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the other work I do is I, I write poetry and I do these text-based works. Um, I do a lot of different things. I think I jump around a lot just because it's easier to um, balance different parts of my focus and different kind of topics. Like uh, a lot of these text works kind of come out of this frustration of explaining things. And what I love about poetry is it's the very last diluted form of what you have energy to explain about anything. Um, and it, it just hits the core easier by creating an atmosphere rather than going into these lawn expositions. Um, and I also, yeah, this was uh, from a show that I did, uh, at part of a group show. I also do curation. I, I feel like I should talk about that. <laughs> so right now I work at Grunt Gallery. I'm a curator for basically everything I've done has been relating to queer indigenous art. Um, and we recently did an issue of a zine called Projections, and I put out this prompt saying, like, tell me what you imagine for the future, like, really kind of naively and um, expecting, like, these, uh, not glossy visions of the future, but just sort of, like, kind of work around repair and stuff. But um, every contributor that I asked, kind of spiraled out and then I spiraled out and it was just like this weird <laughs> pit of despair because I think for <laughs> I think for queer indigenous people like our ideas of the future are very much predicated on these ideas of like I'm 29 years old now which is older than I'd ever thought I'd be and having to think about a future after assuming you were going to not make it for so long um, becomes really complicated. Um, and I, yeah, I don't, I 
don't know how to speak to that all the time because it, it is really painful and it's something I actually want to be excited about the future. I mean, um, but it's it's a heavy place, especially when you see currently in like dialogues about resurgence that there, there's still often not a lot of space for queer indigenous identities. And there are many of us who are estranged from our own communities and not being able to participate in ceremony um, and just really crappy mentalities left over by residential schooling, especially in my community, the Catholic Church had a profound impact on my community to the point where my mom like lied to my grandmother and said we were like totally baptized so that she would talk to us. <laughs> so stuff like that, which is just a lot to unpack. Um, I feel I talked enough, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Hannah, you're up. <laughs> I'm sorry, no warning. <laughs> yeah. Um, hello, my name's Hannah Brunty. Um, I just, before I started, I had a really um, incredible um, feeling being on this country. It's really different. It's my first time. Um, and all of the songs as well, I feel like a really different rhythm to the way that we do ceremony. So that's been really beautiful and I um, really like to say thank you for having me. Um, so my name's Hannah Bronte. Um, Bronte is my middle name because all the last names that are in our family were um, slave names or like Freeman and Cooper and McCoy. They're all names of owners. So I think from really young, um, I just didn't like it. Like I already kind of, and I also feel like Hannah Bronte sounded more diva. But um, <laughs> you got the umlaut, yeah. you know, the, the two dots. <laughs> I liked it, but yeah. Um, but I also then, as I was older, I was like, I also didn't really feel very attached to um, any of those last names either. Um, so I'm a Waka Waka and Jaeger woman and I have Welsh ancestry and even some um, West Indies diaspora to Wales. Um, I think it's important as well, like listening to everybody speak to acknowledge all of it as well, because my mum um, raised me as a single parent and she's an incredibly big part of supporting my practice and, um, yeah, you know, she isn't Indigenous, but she would let me at six be like, I want to go to the rally, like, you know, and she would let me go with my aunties and I think that's a really beautiful, important thing as well. I never, ever had a... Um, all I had was support from her. I never felt like that was a challenge. Um, so I practice um, out of Mianjin, Brisbane, but that's not my country. My country... Um, my grandfather's country is inner west Queensland, so it's um, like the bush. And then um, my grandmother's country is Yeagle, so it's um, on the northern New South Wales coast. And so it's very different when I go, like, depends which side of the family, but it's, like, incredibly different peoples as well. I think sometimes um, when you say you're Indigenous, a lot of people, or even Indigenous Australian, sometimes people get an idea of one thing, but, like, it's a very vast country and, like, the peoples are very different. Um, so they're kind of my lineage. I think for this first slide, this is a recent work. Um, it was called Healer. Um, I think I was just really tired of being tough. I was trying to be tough for all the women in my community and my family. And then um, we lost quite a lot of um, young women. Sorry. <laughs> um, and it was really hard. Um, and I was really tired of being, sorry of being um, tough, because it's exhausting. And we had four suicides, and um, they were like my sissies. So, oh, sorry. It's okay. um, so I wrote a love letter to my grief, because I just didn't know how to hold it. And um, all my other work had kind of been very, you know, protective and tough and, like, we're going to make it. But then I sort of felt like I'm just so tired and I'm 28 and I'm really tired. So I think sometimes with this, like, term of future, I totally... Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> sometimes I'm, it's like, yeah, I feel like a little nana. But um, mm -hmm. I'm, like, learning as well that that's also part of it and that's, like, part of how you learn to be kind as well is all of that. But I think that um, my recent work, I've been, um, like, if I saw myself five years ago and said, you're going to cry on a panel, I would have been like, um, <laughs> go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> I was just very staunch, but, like, I still feel like I can be where I need to be. But I think it's also um, 
it's protective, like, to have an alter ego even within my art for all my sissies. Like, sometimes, like, you know, like, they're not here now and I want to imagine, like, what it would feel like if they had felt okay to just be in it and be in their grief and if we could have talked about it properly or that maybe, like, our spaces for healing, they're really broken and um, it's not okay to be weak or to be um, feeling like you're super challenged. I'm not sure... I just don't know how to hold that space yet. So I guess, like, within art... And it was. It was kind of like a weird future prediction of... Um, I wanted to imagine if they could have swum in their grief and hopped out, that maybe wherever they are or whatever has happened, that would still, I don't know, ease something. But, yeah, I think that all the other... Um, let's, like, go to the next slide. <laughs> That's, a loaded. That's a loaded one, yeah. I didn't... I didn't I, put that in but yeah <laughs> um so this one is um is burning I actually made it in like 2016 oh maybe 15 even but um it's hair um on the back of um her that's like a hair cloak um it was used in grieving ceremonies so all the aunties only aunties that had birthed three or more women um they were the ones that were like um essentially now like kind of the like western version is like a death doula like that vibe but yeah um the awals are like my nana and um her aunties and grandmothers that was their role so um you know they'd be there for births and they'd be there for deaths and they kind of were um not like loners but like they definitely like kept their distance because of the energetic levels what they had to give to these people they couldn't be too close so it was kind of an odd thing within communities um like our walls were like kind of like um, like black widow spiders. Like they would like have babies and then like ditch them in once they'd like had a child and then kind of keep cruising. So I found that really fascinating. And all their stories are kind of about like they can, you know, because they're psychic as part of it is like seeing destruction far before it happens. Um, so it was very strange even doing some of these. That photo is just like a CGI photo, but um, that country actually burnt like it's the beginning of last year. Um, like that's um, out near Sherberg in like inner west Queensland it's like um, it's planted forests as well but still it's the back of a border and I sort of freaked myself out and I was like, oh, like maybe I won't do any more like fire images but yeah <laughs> um, the next one is the show that's on right now um, Future Ancient yeah I guess looking at all the kind of indigenous futurism stuff my favourite term was a Pacifica term this Fijian writer I was speaking to told me about called Austronesian which I just thought was, like, way cooler than, like, indigenous futures. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I've always been trying to... That's kind of what that work was because it's called Future Ancient, sorry. Because um, I didn't... I don't know. I just wanted, like, a way of something more... Because it's kind of superhero and, like... But I thought Astronesian's the coolest one I've heard so far. But then Future Ancient was, like, what I was trying to figure out. Yeah, and a lot of the words for future, I don't know, a lot of our words and our language, they mean all of it, like past, present and future in one word. So it's kind of an interesting thing as well anyway. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's necklaces. <laughs> I don't feel like um, this is the images. It's kind of representative of like past, present and future and this idea of, um, yeah, I guess this like magic landscape that's been untouched by colonisation. Um, yeah, and these three women as well. Um, they're all poets and, like, creative and um, I kind of just let them... I chose the, um, you know, costuming and colours and stuff, but even the way that they chose to pose or climb or, like, yeah, I let it go. I didn't really direct any of that. I let them feel it and imagine um, that they were, you know, like they were in countries that had never been touched and what would that feel like? Yeah, so that's it. I think that's way enough chat. <laughs> that was good. Christopher? Uh, Chamai, Kiyana uh, Sanuk. I'm Chris. I'm uh, Alutic and Norwegian on my mom's side, and I am Hungarian on my dad's side. And I grew up in Fall City, Washington, and um, currently in Oakland, California. And um, so these are the pieces that I have up right now in transit and returns. And um, sorry, I thought. I thought we were going to start from the, the woodcut pieces, if possible, yeah. Uh, the next one. Oh, no, uh, the last one, if possible. 
Yeah, and then we could just work our way backwards. Yeah, okay. So um, I pretty much uh, started to work with wood after uh, I visited Anchorage, um, I think it was 2011, to work with um, Perry Eaton, who is also an Alutic carver, um, who makes masks. Um, and sorry, I'm going to rewind. So <laughs> this is my first time on a panel discussion, so I'm kind of like scattered. But um, so I uh, met my cousin Jerry Lactonin when I was probably 20. Um, luckily, he was living down near where I was in Seattle at the time. And uh, my mom had his number and stuff. Growing up, she told me that you had a cousin, or that I had a, co a cousin who was a mask maker. And because we grew up away from Kodiak, which is um, where my family's from, um, I wasn't sure what that meant. So I guess later on in my teens, I started to develop uh, curiosity. And I finally called him. And I met him. And he was really cool. And, and I, he just had this, I don't know, there's like this really easy connection with him. Um, and so he just started teaching me about the island. He grew up in, in Larson Bay, which is where um, my grandpa grew up. My grandma grew up in uh, Karluk, which is another village in Kodiak. And um, so he told me, he, he would be telling me stories about the villages growing up and, I don't know, being on barcas and stuff like that, which I didn't really know too much at the time. Uh, what that meant, but so actually he would take me kayaking and stuff, and so I started to, I don't know, like feel like I was a part of, I don't know, the past, I guess, or not the past, but my family, and um, there's like sort of a void, there's kind of uh, this darkness, you know, in, in our families, and I kind of wondered what, why that was. Um, also, why I was, you know, in existence, and so I looked back, um, and and I started to gain curiosity <clears throat> about wood carving, why Jerry was carving, um, and it started to make more sense um, when he told me that, that he had to move away from Larson Bay after the Exxon Valdez oil spill and the devastation that created for the fishing community up there. Um, and so, yeah, he moved and he started carving. Um, this is around the same time that uh, Helen Simeonov uh, attended this lecture um, that was held in Kodiak about these masks that were recently discovered in uh, this castle in France, in Paris, or, uh, outside of Paris, in uh, boulogne sur and. Uh, no one else was really interested at the time on the island, <clears throat> but she was very interested. And uh, it took her a few years to save up money, and she visited the, the castle. And um, because of her, um, pretty much uh, because of her, we, I, I was able to see the masks in person. I think it was in like 2000, 2008, 2007. And um, the, after that, I was like, OK. like. It felt like a, I felt like a surge, and so I started to want to learn how to carve, and ask Perry if he if he would help me. Um, at the time, I was going to school at the San Francisco Art Institute, and um, he had a he was a sort of, I think he's on the board of trustees still, um, but he uh, was like, hey, well, if you ever want to come up to Anchorage, like, I would love to, you know, teach you, and I thought that'd be good. So I went up, and um, yeah, I just remember flying over and looking at the water. And then once we landed, going to the studio and starting to carve, pretty much, and uh, realizing how much when you're carving with gouges, how much uh, that looks like the water when you're flying over it. And so I started to think about how strange it is. We have bird masks. Um, how strange it is that when you're carving a bird mask, you're like kind of like becoming. <laughs> Like you're just like, it's like this weird, I don't know, 
paradox almost, or not a paradox, it's just like this weird, like you're staring at water while looking at a bird from their perspective, I guess. Um, and so I got really into it, and I just like wanted to carve a lot. And so um, with this piece, Chungag Nak does a wall dance. Um, I made this for a show that um, Sarah Biscard Dilly, who co-created the show, um, co-created there. Um, and this was about five years ago, I think. Um, and uh, the show was in San Francisco. And so I kind of like was thinking about what a site-specific piece would look like um, that I could make. Um, I didn't want to make a traditional mask because I didn't feel like I, that was something I could do yet. Um, so I just decided to, to sort of reflect this particular instance. And what it is is um, in 1815, um, the Russian-American company took um, a group of natives, uh, Alutic natives, uh, Kodak natives, down the coast for a fur trade and um, ended up in Fort Ross where uh, some shit happened. And um, uh, Chungagnak, who is now known as St. Peter the Aleut, was murdered and martyred after that. And it just was so strange to me, the whole, like, how a Alutic um, person uh, ended up in Fort Ross, like this like Russian colony in San Francisco. <clears throat> um, and I looked at the Wikipedia page, and at the time I was working at a thrift store in Seattle, and I was taking in donations, and someone tried donating these wood panels, which we would not have been able to sell. And I was like, huh, this is strange. Like, what if I like carved the Wikipedia page? Um, <laughs> And then I was like, oh, actually, like, it's kind of strange because um, like, the p old people on the islands, they would take uh, the way they would, the wood that they would use to carve the mask is all driftwood, pretty much, because there was very little wood, wood on the island. So I was like, oh, it's like, kind of like this wood that <laughs> is coming in, and I'm going to transform it and bring it down there and sort of have it be this momentary thing, because afterwards, um, I'm gonna, I ended up destroying it. We uh, destroy our masks after we dance them. Um, so it became this uh, momentary kind of like, I took a, it took like a long time to carve it. Like day and night, I spent probably a month, which is long to me, I guess. <laughs> but it, it was like a lot of, you know, a lot of work. And uh, so we brought it down. Um, I tried bringing it back up to Seattle, but the plane wouldn't, the people on the plane wouldn't let me bring it for some reason, so Sarah actually held on to it <laughs> for a few months. Thank you, Sarah. And um, and then it's like actually like let's just destroy it at F Fort Ross. So we brought it to Fort Ross. Uh, uh, Sarah was kind enough to drive me there, and um, that was on election day. And um, I ended up flying to France to try to find to to see the masks again. And um, yeah. I wasn't able to because it was a national holiday. <laughs> so um, anyway, so that's that piece. Um, if oh yeah, so I started doing these other carvings. And I guess I just wanted to show these carvings because um, I'm working a lot with dimension. Um, the idea of uh, two dimension and three dimension, how maybe everything's just so blurred now. Um, I guess with the last piece with Chung, Chung Agnok does a wall dance, I was sort of thinking about um, composite features, uh, whether it be through religious aspects or um, time. So how documentation has changed significantly from like uh, oral tradition uh, to uh, documents and how right now on the internet, you know, you could change a Wikipedia. Like yesterday I looked at the Wikipedia page for uh, Chungagnak, and it's changed since that, you know, but I destroyed it, so it, it doesn't, <laughs> like, you know, it's like a, sort of a ritualistic thing, but yeah, so uh, you can flip to the, yeah, so with these, um, I'm using composite features again. Um, if you look at it closely, the borders, they kind of looks like a three-dimensional box, um, but it's a three-dimensional piece, but it's a two-dimensional, you know, it's red two-dimensionally. Um, is that sperm? Yeah, going counterclockwise. <laughs> um, 
And the hands is the hands um, of our creator. Um, Lamswa. So take what you need. <laughs> so yeah. I, yeah, I will flag that I realize that we are, like, I thought we had all this time and we actually don't, but I want to, just because I want people to have the space to still talk, because uh, Chantal, you haven't had a chance to talk either. So I'm just going to flag that, but like, yeah, take your take your time because I'll. I don't think any nobody's gonna tell me to to not continue. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't realize how long I was talking. No, it's okay. That's my job. And <laughs> oh, okay. My job is gonna take up more space. Yeah. I think so. Is it till three? Yeah. Oh my god, then we're doing to totally fine. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm all just getting a top. I'm like, you're not gonna tell me what to do, and I'm like, oh wait, we have an hour. Shit. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no worries. <laughs> oh, no. It's cool. Um, so, yeah, I guess, yeah, we could just go to um, these pieces. And um, these are in the show right now. And I started working on these pieces, or this tech sort of like technique, um, a while ago. Um, but I, I was thinking about the violence of land allotment and how that was created um, by the use of maps and um, gridding them out and, you know, purposing, repurposing, or um, revaluing, or adding a different type of value to this thing that, you know, the, pers the person who's creating it does not understand the implication of what they're doing. And so I found this uh, Norman Rockwell book while walking one day, and, um, I thought it'd be a good, an interesting thing to do is to sort of uh, do the same thing to like a, this American dream that a lot of us aren't even allowed or, you know, we're never invited to. Um, that is also just a faded thing, you know, it's not, if you look at a, Norman Rockwell like is just looking at those images kind of creep me out because um, it's just like so, yeah, it's a, uh, I don't know, very strange, because it's like this um, nostalgia that you weren't even invited to. But um, yeah, so I chopped them up, and I did it chronologically. Um, I think, um, to me, for some reason, there's like this, it gave it a, a more eerie feeling to put it back in the place where it was supposed to be, you know? Um, this actually was just published as a book. I didn't think it would actually happen, but it was put out about a week ago. Um, but yeah, it's the book that I got, um, it, I put it back the way, but just like, yeah, fucked up. <laughs> anyway, um, I guess I just wanted to say that I feel like um, I connect to my ancestors through the mode of actually doing things. Um, with the cut up pieces, I guess I'm, I feel like I'm, it's sort of a, kind of a joke. <laughs> um, it's kind of a dark joke, but like my uncle, or my cousin Jerry, um, he uh, made a piece right after the Exxon Valdez spill of Joe Hazelwood, who is the, the person who crashed the ship. And um, I thought that, like thinking about that just kind of blew my mind. Um, because I, I feel like that was sort of like an indig indigenous futurism moment. There's like this uh, connection to this thing that totally fucked up a lot, and then sort of going back to creating masks. And um, so it's this weird, yeah, flip. Anyway, uh, thank you. <laughs> All from the it's all from the same book. These yeah, these two? are all from the same book. Um, there's a lot of like holes in them, <laughs> which is a uh, very very strange. I I guess like when I was making them, I was I was living in Brooklyn, New York, and um, I would come home and just immediately go to them, and uh, it's kind of a dark time uh, and you know like just meditating 
on, you know, what I was doing and um, what has been done, why these books exist, why we have to do the things that we do now. And it's like, it's not totally nihilistic at all, in my opinion. I think it's an activity and that um, it helps, you know, these things we do to, to get by and we share them with people who have, uh, you know, a similar way of, you know, trying not to completely fold. Um, and not to say that I'm like really depressed or anything, but like, like uh, no, it's just like kind of like, I'm not gonna draw like happy faces or anything right now. Uh, you know, unless it's like, I don't know, totally mind bending or something. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm, this is uh, pretty much what I've been working on late, like this is, yeah, what I've been working on lately. And I'm very happy that it's being shown here. Thanks. Yeah, miigwech. Chantal. Hi. <clears throat> Talofa. I'm Chantal. I'm um, the child of Samoan immigrants um, who migrated from Apia, Samoa to Auckland, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and then to Sydney, Australia, then to uh, what is now known as Brisbane, um, Mianjin, and we've lived there since 1994. Um, I'm a contemporary artist. I work across many different um, sort of mediums. I, it, I work with ideas mainly, um, so performance, video, uh, sculpture, textile. It, I really don't like reducing them to themes because I, I'm really not into the way. I think one of the challenges is constantly reading art within materiality boxes. So, but for the sake of this, um, I'll give you an idea. So it's, uh, yeah, installation, um, performance, uh, video, et cetera. It's, it's multidisciplinary. So I work with ideas, like as most artists do, I guess. Um, I guess when I'm thinking of futurisms, um, it's probably not something that I unpack regularly because I think it's inherently um, part of me in the way that I work and the way that um, I view health, view my family's health. Uh, it's, it's part of survival, I think. And I w want to mention that I use the term survival very humbly because I'm not an Indigenous Australian. I reside on ind Indigenous Australian land. So when I say Indigenous, please be aware that I'm talking about um, myself as a Samoan um, who is no longer part of the homeland that I belong to. But I mean absolutely no disrespect to my Indigenous sister here because we have incredibly different experiences and I certainly don't want to compare that because what has happened in Australia and what is happening in Australia right now is fucking terrible. And we have at no stage made any progress. So I also want to mention that although I'm an immigrant and the child of an immigrant, I am an immigrant myself who's been naturalised, so I am an Australian citizen. But what is happen happening in currently in Australia is we have people who have been naturalised uh, in threat of having their citizenship revoked. Um, so we have particular politicians and um, one incredibly uh, prejudiced and racist one called Peter Dutton, I don't know if you've heard, who's been saving au pairs and rushing them visas um, to look after very wealthy dignitaries' children. But there is a very, very, very real threat to asylum seekers um, and anyone who comes from any country who has uh, sought asylum in Australia or who's actually been in Australia for 20, 30, 40 years and become a citizen. So I just want to make that really, really clear that um, I, I certainly... It, it's very complicated, but I certainly do have a position of privilege living on Indigenous land. Um, what I want to talk about, I'm not, I, I actually gave way too many images because I was like on the way to the airport and I freaked out. So I think I gave like 12 images Perfect. because I thought we were going to just keep um, sliding them through. But 
Um, I thought maybe it'd be good to talk about one particular work called To Be Humble in the context of two different exhibition spaces because um, when we're talking about uh, futurisms and I guess the way that we protect, I know in, in the panel before us there was talking about cultural keeping. I think it's really important to talk about the way that we navigate spaces from here on in when we have our, um, our cultural capital, I guess, uh, at stake. Mm -hmm. So can I get you just to uh, go forward Maybe until you go to the nighttime ones. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I gave way too many. Keep going. Yeah, keep going, keep going. I didn't realize I put those ones in. Okay, um, <laughs> can you, good. yeah. I mean, we want you to talk about those because they're really good. <laughs> um, okay, so the, uh, I'll try and be really quick when I explain it. So maybe you don't have to. We have like well, actually lots okay. of time now. So like, I, don't. <laughs> I, I I put the fear of anxiety into us, and I I revoke it. I revoke it. I just it. don't want to go off on a tangent. And I'm like I don't think I know what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so this performance it's a performance. It's not really a performance. It was an event. It was a we existed for those three hours. So. Um, that was uh, called To Be Humble. It was about, I got invited to a program called First Thursdays. Um, there's no one from the IMA here, hey. What did you do No, I just, <laughs> <laughs> is it being recorded? Um, <laughs> well, I wanna, I'm gonna be really honest. Go for because it. Because this is, I guess, this is a very real struggle in my practice and many people's practices in Australia, is that we're, uh, you know, part of the romanticism of, of artists like us is ornamentation. And so there's um, a tendency to want uh, us when it's, it's trendy and it's the flavor of the month or the year or the, maybe perhaps it's what uh, the funding is uh, dependent on, the delivery of a Pacific or Asian um, exhibition. But what happens when that runs out and what happens when there are, what happens when the bad part comes in? Do you still, you know, do you still want us? Can we, will you be interested? And so um, I was invited to a, kind of like, a, it was called First Thursdays. And I have to commend Sanchintia Simpson, who's not here, but she's a wonderful, wonderful arts worker who actually initiated uh, this program at the Institute of Modern Art in Brisbane. And she is an artist. Um, she's of Indian and South African heritage. She's a very beautiful person. A lot of you would have met her in Brisbane. And part of her role was actually, she's an artist and she wanted to get that job purely to get more artists of colour into the program. Because all we would see is uh, European um, a sort of international art that would be willing to exhibit for the three months slot over the calendar year. And so the only risk they were prepared to take was three hours once a month, you know, at this first Thursday's event. And so I was maybe the sixth artist, Hannah was also a part of that. Um, and I remember being that whole experience was very challenging. So we're talking about three hours, very ephemeral event. And it was very challenging. It was very controlling. And it was, um, I get it. It was, a, it was not a testament to the future, the futuristic thought of our gallery workers in institutions. And so through that, you actually come to realise that you and your colleagues are eons ahead of what any of these art thinkers are wanting to program and wanting to think. And that when you talk to them and when you need to um, deliver an event, you actually have to dumb yourself back down and set the framework so they can understand it. Yet for people like us, we've had to learn two different histories. We've had to learn the history so we can be accepted within this world. And then we have this here that's right at the front that we can't actually ignore. So for that, that evening I wanted to 
absorb the energy of everybody because I think I was exhausted. I was over it. I thought, I'm just going to do what I want. They're not going to invite me back. Um, which is because then the commute happened a few months ago. So they did. But um, it, it was like a purge. And it, the purge really worked. <laughs> it was like this energy. Um, uh, so really quickly, the cultural reference is, is, is Ifunga. It's Samoan. I've never seen it. My mother hasn't seen it. It happens in villages. I don't want to give you an anthropolo anthropological explanation. You can look it up. Um, it's, uh, it's the act of penance. And so um, I invited the audience to sit and be cloaked with me or without me if they wanted to, but I was going to absorb the energy within that three-hour period of people's thoughts, people's humility, their joy, their sadness. Um, but what I found in that work was a very literal understanding um, and demand from the um, gallery staff saying, you know, what are people sorry for? You know, because they're kind of reading this penitence and humility in their context, and I'm not interested in that. I'm sick of telling, you know, people, you, lear you learn it. I, I, know what con I know what humility and penitence means in your context. Do your work and you learn it in mine. And so for that work, it was so challenging. They were coming up with ideas like, can people write it down in a hat? And put, you know, and it was, you know, it was really frustrating. And I felt like, wow, you have these exhibitions that go for three months per exhibition, $40,000 budgets, and you can't take a risk on a local Samoan woman for three hours. And so without these really, really rudimentary, literal um, questions. So uh, it was a very beautiful night. I had my young cousin, Jarek, um sort of lead the performance. You can probably, maybe, is there another one there or no? Oh, there you go. Yeah. So um, there were lots of, lots of different things that we could cover ourselves with, but uh, I sat uh, for the whole duration and um, my cousin Jarek, I, I got him to uh, speak words of provocation, sing songs. Um, it was really interesting because he's, he's an actor. Well, he wasn't, he was an actor. He was studying, but he's from Samoa. So he had to pay up front. So, it, you know, in Australia, you, don't, you have a delayed uh, hex fee, we call it, to go to university, but you have to be a citizen. And so Jarek, because he was Samoan, he lived here for seven years, but he wasn't qualified to get citizenship. And so this performance actually happened a week before he had to quit university because he couldn't afford it anymore. So I got him to perform uh, these words because he's also very, very young. And I guess in our families, the youngest is often the one with no voice. So it was really important for me to be the, him, for him to be the face and the voice of all of these words and all of these songs. Um, it was very beautiful, and there was, um, it, at the end of it, it needed no explanation. So when Jarek unveiled people, there was about 20 people underneath, but none of them asked for an explanation. So it, you know, it really, it really is important that I think institutions don't dictate too much of what you, you know, don't underestimate, I think you were saying before, don't, astro don't un underestimate the audience, you know, and so, um, so that was a, actually ended up being a wonderful ex experience, but I think that was because I had agreed to just, who gives a crap anymore? Just don't worry about it, just do what you want. Um, another very bad example of that is if you go to the first image, uh, Art Space Sydney uh, asked for it to be performed there, and so this is a great example of why not everything needs to be in a gallery, because I don't think galleries actually house art perfectly. And if we want to talk about futurisms, we need to talk about futurisms in the context of art and experience happening anywhere. Galleries do not create art. They're wonderful spaces and they have their place, but not, art, not all art can fit into gallery spaces. And so this was a horrible experience. Um, it, I wouldn't say horrible. 
I love the art space people, by the way. Talia Linz is a brilliant curator. She's a wonderful, wonderful supportive person, but you know, you have a space to work with and they want an idea, they want a concept and they want the same thing. What happened was I felt incredibly vulnerable and cr incredibly unsafe. And so through the warp and weft of the Hessian or the, um, the Iyakonga, the mat, you can actually see people just staring. And so at the IMA, it was beautiful because I could, I could hear Jarek's feet shuffling as he was dancing and it was nighttime and I could hear people breathing and I could, this was very different. I could see a very inner city Sydney crowd just staring at us as, as though we were performing a cultural act for them. And for that, I was very sorry to Jarek because I felt like my duty of care wasn't there and that I should have not agreed to actually do the second iteration there. And so I think that when we're talking about futurisms, we need to be really, really conscious of what works where. And you have spaces where art exists, but that doesn't always do the art and the concept and the experience and the safety justice. Yeah. Um, I think there's like a piece, it's the one that's in the, the gallery. Do you want to speak about? Oh, the turbine. Yeah. yeah. So my work's the turbine. <laughs> it's a fully working turbine, but obviously because it's contextless, it's um, not living to its full capacity. Um, so I'm very uh, interested in, uh, Lana Lopez is the curator who worked with me, and that was a, a very, very, very safe, wonderful experience. So I, I have to graciously thank Lana. Um, part, of, part of moving forward is also about very careful and loving curatorial and artistic relationships and investing in those relationships, not curating artists in a show that lasts for 30 days and then you never see them again. The, the, the investment that Alana has put in has been incredibly beneficial. So this work here um, actually is, um, I'm, I, I'm quite interested in that, that I guess the irony in when all of, all of your models and ideas and resources have been exhausted after you've pillaged everything from everyone, you've capitalized on environmental um, uh, health and beauty, remedies, medicines, ideas, um, you then revert to green um, methodologies to solve all the problems that you know, like that you've created. So, um, in Australia, the wind turbines. We don't. I think we have a couple that are about to. It's a. The wind turbines are very political in Australia because we're a mining country, um, and in Queensland, where I live, we are a mining state. Not as much as Western Australia, but there's a lot of people along the coast and further up north, Queensland, um, that sustain their lives in mining and. Trillions of dollars have been made with mining. So in this talk of climate change in Australia, climate, anything to do with environment is incredibly political because it stabs at the income and pockets of our wealthiest, wealthiest people. Um, and so I am, I'm quite interested in in this whole sort of new discussion of indigenous solutions to fix non-indigenous problems. Um, the wind turbine, I guess, is also an example of maybe that one directional energy that happens with artists of color in the institutions. Um, because the wind turbine actually works, it's generated via energy. It's sort of a comment on the lack of energy that I receive often from arts audiences and the discussions of around my work that reduce it to ornamentation and reduce it to an anthropological discussion um, because that's not in something that I'm interested in having and that's really work that you should be doing. Um, and so it's, 
so the, the wind turbine sort of sits as an ornamentational uh, romantic object that bedazzles you and draws you in. But that's all you can see because you can't see it working to its full potential because it's not in the context that it should be. So when you displace objects and you displace spirit, they're not working to their full potential. What do you expect? So, um, uh, but if you were to put it in front of the air conditioning, it will just, it'll <laughs> definitely turn. So just regenerate that energy. <laughs> So, <laughs> and energy is like, you know, I'm thinking in the space between, it's kind of the, the you know, it's often the one, the one directional gift that artists of colour give and don't receive back. Yeah. I think that was all I wanted. Oh, another thing I wanted to say about um, the thinking about Judy of Care uh, and the investment um, of artists moving forward and moving into the future is that work uh, was constructed a few weeks after my dad died. And so that was a very intense time to try and deliver um, an artwork and two other deadlines in the weeks following dad's death. And I think that had I not been in the commute with five incredibly caring uh, curators, it would have been a much, it would have been a very, very, very bad experience. So that work was commissioned because it was supported and the curators fought for funding so I could do that. And without that ease, that time of my life would have been far more hell than it actually was. So when, we, when we're moving forward, we need to think about the care of family and the investment that some of us have with family in a cultural sense. And some of that funding actually supported my family and helped with funeral expenses, which is unheard of if this was going to be an exhibition at any other kind of institution as part of a biennale. So I will say that the experience within this exhibition that came from the curators is quite exceptional and quite rare, but it saved me. Yeah, Miigwech, thank you all of you for um, speaking truth and power to your work. And honestly, like I, I have all these questions in my head, but I'm like, damn, that one answered it. And then that one, because it's like it's all there. If you hadn't noticed um, the way in which we speak about land-based practices, like how there's always that reference to home or to the dispossession. It's like there's always that reference, that grounding point um, of like where we come from and like what that means like to us and also it's like how we now are um, when we enter into these like into these institutions that were not made with us in mind um, but in the things that we can produce for them um, you know if you think about anthropology and um, those kind of beings those belongings you know um, Kind of trying to like reframe that thinking, you know, because this could be a this could definitely be a belonging. It'd be amazing to see this like John's dump, like you know, uh, wind turbine out there doing its thing, you know, for the community to generate power in in a, in that way. And I think it's so there's something like so poignant about the fact that it's there and it's like it's just like still and it's not moving and it's you know and it's be it's beautiful, but it's also kind of, there's like this kind of like dark humor to it as well. You know, in that way it really, you know, makes you think. And I see that a lot too within each of, um, I see that, yeah, with each of your practices and also like the vulnerability that it takes to come up here and to share these practices, um, to share these teachings, to share um, when you get indigenous people to come and share with you, holy, like, um, Y'all are very, very lucky, I'd say. <laughs> like truth, truth, you know, because um, it takes a lot because I think I've, as I'm like listening, you know, to this salmon run and the fact that like we're trying to make blankets and they can't, we can't, you know, and they're, and they're like we're trying to make blankets, but we're, we can't even uh, go to a place and just like be there and be present because we're trying to get stuff done because like how many other things are we doing? And so I feel like we're on this trajectory 
of like apocalypse and everyone's like the earth is dying and politically we're fucked you know because we have a like a genocidal denier who is going to be maybe voted into power because we have another we just have these politicians who don't speak for us who have these agendas you know when we've I think as indigenous peoples, I think it's safe to say that there's already been an apocalypse. We talked, I kind of talked about this earlier, and I think indigenous people have been already talking about this for a long time, where they've, you've, or we, like a way, certain ways of life have been suppressed or even extinguished, um, um, and not for a lack of like, for, for a lack of survival and for lack of trying, because the amount of resistance, could you imagine if people could just like be Right and like what would come out of that. So this is this ain't our first rodeo, and um, and I feel like that resistance isn't. It doesn't necessarily scare me, but I don't know how y'all feel about that. Like, how do we continue to to do the things that we need to do with this like impending doom that wasn't ours to begin with? You know, and how do you see yourselves as like, you know, working cultural people with um, with stories and. Uh, belongings and things to share with with every you know because that's I hope you know maybe that's that's why I do it but it's also maybe you know these are just questions that I'm thinking of um, why do we do what we do and how do how do we continue to do uh, when we know that maybe another sort of like ending and an ending is coming you know That was not an easy question to yeah. ease into, damn. Like, it was like, maybe this, this will spark, this is for a conversation. Well, I was having a conversation with one of my friends about the climate strike uh, actions that have been happening. Um, I didn't go, I didn't plan to go, and it's like, obviously it's this thing that is important in some kind of context of like showing up and making a presence, but the reason I didn't want to go is that those spaces are predominantly white and like there's something really disturbing to me when I see protests like that that have people in these like wild getups that are like very ornamental and costumey and it looks like a carnival and and like everybody is white and I'm sort of like fuck you man like you could show up for this protest but when it comes down to standing up and like being on your territory you count on indigenous people to stand in front of guns and um, like that's a really frustrating thing for me, like especially over this past winter, um, seeing the Unistoten camp be invaded and seeing, seeing people who took care of me when I grew up being manhandled and arrested and um, it feels really crappy to be like this indigenous queer person who's kind of estranged from their community but still has such a deep love and feels so guilty and shameful when I can't be there standing beside my elders and making sure that they don't have to do the work. Like, we're supposed to be taking care of them. Um, so, like, doing art is, for me at least, it's just this one thing I do have, especially with the indigenous queer community, where it's like we can make these spaces even when we can't always be in the ones we want to be in. Um, and you have somewhere to go back to in these urban spaces especially. Um, like the connectivity uh, that happens. Um, I curated an event over uh, this last spring called Together Part Queer Indigeneities, um, which is happening through Grant Gallery, um, and we brought together, I don't know how, <laughs> like with 20 grand brought together like 15 different people from across Turtle Island to <laughs> like, <laughs> I know. Only 20, are you serious? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> For three days and it was just this like extravaganza of um, energy and I think a lot of us, we were just excited to meet one another, like at the programming, that happened, I was like, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy with this for what it is and how much work and quick turnaround time it was, but like, the big comment afterwards was just like, people seemed really happy that we were able to connect in that way. And I hope that it propels people to continue going forward and it, I know it has for me and then like, I wanna make that happen again. 
Um, and as an artist, like I really love group shows because I get to meet people and it's better to me than upholding a single person at a solo show more often than not, which also has its place, but you know. I think connecting like this is super important and I think it's very effective. Um, I think I have learnt a lot. Um, I've learnt a lot more connecting with people of other First Nations than I have in 15 years of living in Brisbane with the arts community there. So I think that one way to deal with that, and I think um, it was Charlene who was talking on a panel yesterday who said that when she went to New Zealand that she stayed it from, I think, north to south, a whole bunch of different Marais. They had the Maori people were talking about helping them and, and what kind of what issues did they have and how could they help them? How could they help them move forward with that? And I think that that's so important that um, at different levels we do this. I think connecting via the ocean has been far easier than connecting even locally with some people and um, having these sorts of conversations locally um, is far more diff difficult. So most certainly forums like this and projects like The Commute is really effective, but we also have to be really mindful of kind of protecting that model before it gets taken away from us as, you know, and adopted. So, um, yeah, that wasn't that. Because I think about that a lot, because I, I asked questions about that earlier, about like as we do reclamation and as we are trying to kind of like for some of us that um, maybe we're further away from community or like just distant and didn't have as much access um, as we try to reclaim and like um, catch up as well, even though we know it's, we always know it's here as well. Um, it's always in here, it just we just have to remember because it's not lost, it's always here, but it's like, um, it's like the access to that and who gets access to that. And I think that's part of um, our inherent survival as well and being able to practice and being able to be, um, yeah. I think we're also very privileged as artists that we get to unpack ideas like this. So I can only talk from a, 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 Pacific, a Pacific point of view, but as someone who's part of the Pacific diaspora in, in Australia, I have a very, very, very lucky position that I can sit amongst um, colleagues like you and unpack this and talk about it. This is not something that my mother as a, um, you know, factory worker who packed vitamins for a living, trying to trying to pay rent and trying to keep food on the table, or my father who was incredibly educated but moved to Australia and had his first job at Red Rooster. This is not something that was an option for them. So for me, as an artist, I have a really special role that I can... Um, prolong this kind of thought or even introduce this kind of thought to my cousins, to my brothers, to my nieces and nephews, to others who are too busy trying to make a living and, and pay for themselves living in an expensive city like Sydney or with sick children. This is, we need to be very aware of the power that we hold within our family as well because we're um, exposed to this kind of thought very futuristic thought, and it's survival thought. And so for me, I'm, I, you know, I, I ebb and flow between um, humility in, because sometimes I think I'm not working hard enough like all of the rest of them because it's, I feel sometimes indulgent. But then I can also be that person who can, um, you know, unpack something with mum and kind of, decolonize some of her mind because she, through no fault of her own, has been brought up in, in, a, in an environment where she needed to assimilate and where she's needed to adopt, view, adopt views. So we have a, a very important role within our communities if we have the privilege of being able to talk about things like this. Does that resonate for any of the rest of you? Do you have something? Yeah, I guess like uh, what I was talking about earlier was um, 
like earlier on in my practice, I was really unraveling that displacement aspect uh, with my work. And a lot of my work actually really directly spoke back to the colonizers and was really literal. And I, there became a point where I just felt like I was like really burning myself out with that kind of work and wanted to make work that didn't have that hindrance or like I didn't have to think about that hindrance of, of uh, the colonizers basically like, I mean, there was the potlatch ban here on the coast that really, um, it was 67 years where our art was outlawed. And when you look at it today, um, it's also now like very commodified. So being like a practitioner of Northwest Coast art, it's always been important for me not to really be a part of that commodification process, even though I do have to make a living and I do have to survive. Um, it's been important for me to to work on sh in shows like this or work collaboratively with other indigenous artists from other nations uh, and not just make something for consumption. Um, so when I think about futurisms, I guess, like it's like basically how things should be <laughs> moving towards the future. And I think like I have a very dystopic view of the future as well. And um, but you know, I have a son and it's important for me to pass these things to him. So he keeps on uh, passing it on to the, to the generations forward as well. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Can I say, um, so you do such a good job of taking care of people back and I just want to, this is like something I've wanted to say to you for a while, but there's a line in the script that you sent me for Badalbin um, where you're talking about the character Badalbin and how they're someone quiet, but that they're always working for their people. And that's a line that I've always really thought of about you and like um, something that I think about a lot when it, talking about kinship and talking about how to contribute to community, especially when like I also feel like a person who's not going to really stand up and shout something. I'm more like, I'm going to go do something. I'll be back later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Does that resonate with you, Hannah? Because I see that. I see like such power to the image, like to the folks that are in your work as well and what you're trying to communicate. And it's like such a visceral thing because these, it, you can just see how much um, these these sissies in your life mean to you, you know? And it's just like, yeah. Um, I think with all of it though, like the final image isn't the work. Yeah. Yeah, like that's this last mark. And I guess, cause you know, you go to art school and they're like, what's the final image and like all that shit. But I don't think I realized that like us yarning and like laying around and like, you know, like someone who's like really depressed and you go over and like give them a bath and do their washing, like that chat was a big part of all of that, like being in the mess with everyone and then kind of being like, but you're going to be all right. Like I will make sure. So like that became the work. So then by the time it got to, you know, like videoing works and posing for pictures and that kind of stuff, it was still the same. Like we were just still hanging out. And uh, yeah, I sometimes get caught up in that Western view of like this finished product because like it's never going to be finished like it won't be finished till I'm dead <laughs> like yeah. and then even my like kids 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 like it, this isn't linear like it doesn't uh, we don't work like that yeah and even like trying to explain like the word that we have it means like premonition um recollection like deja vu <laughs> like but that's the word for time you know like gala is like it's this I don't know. So it's just even all of those things in together. I don't know. I feel like sometimes this idea, like, naturally all of this stuff lends itself to sci-fi kind of thoughts and things because, it, I don't know, like, that's all interwoven in all of our stories. Yeah. And it is. It's important. But I think it's, like, the chat and it not being linear and it not being finished. Like, I don't think any of my work is ever really finished. Yeah. Well, Gitchi Miigwech, everyone. I know that we're coming close to the end. And uh, so I'm very curious because I'm, you know, maybe folks in the audience have something to say, but I would like for maybe just to take a minute or two to like breathe. And maybe uh, if you are thinking of a question or there's something that you really want to ask, maybe like turn to the person that's around you or you're one of your friends and like maybe pose it to them and see if it's worth asking or... <laughs> 
You know, this is like a polite, this is a very polite way of saying like, you know, like kind of workshop that or if you, you know, um, because also if it's inappropriate, I will shut it down. So just like letting you know, uh, there is no time for BS on Indian time. (laughs) Just kidding, no pressure. But yes, this is like a way of... (laughs) It's really hard to ask. You're really like telling them they can't ask. Yeah, I know, right? I'm like, take the time to ask, but also, Nobody ever yeah. Wants to say things in the audience. I, mean, I know, it's right? It's a Vancouver thing. I don't know, but you, you ask for question and answer, and people are like, <laughs> exactly. So don't wait for that other person. If you got a dying, burning, <laughs> if you got a burning question, this is it. the 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 world is like hurtling, and we might all die. So like, say it now or forever hold your peace. So yeah, okay, perfect, thanks. Awesome. <laughs> that was enough, eh? That was enough. <laughs> awesome. I, I, I really enjoyed everyone sharing. Um, you know, being an artist, it's, it's so nice to hear other stories. My question is, um, how, how can we help and support your work? Like, where can we go to support, you know, your, your ideas or your work? I mean, you guys are working on really sharing these messages and and, and like fighting through and I just don't hear enough of where we could go and like how we could support you rather than just hearing about it and then not knowing what's going to happen down the road so I mean I would love to support so that's my question you showed up that's awesome I love I think it it means a lot to come into a room and not see it be empty um Tell your friends the things you learn. Take them to our shows. You don't have to go to the opening night, but go after. Um, think about the work and spend time with it. Message, if I lived here, message me for a coffee. I think that for me, the older I've gotten, the less I, the, the less I focus on events and more on a very loving, warm time in the studio with artists that I want to get to know and vice versa. So I think that getting to know work can exist outside of the gallery space because as Hannah said, a lot of work to us actually is from the start to the finish, not the finish. And I think that the reading of work is determined by um, a construct, you know, like a Euro-Western artistic construct So for us, the work can be sitting down and having a coffee, watching Netflix and talking through our anxiety, talking through issues. That's that's work and that's really support. So yeah. But if you're in Australia, look me up. I'm happy to have a coffee. (laughs) But I think engaging in in each other's studios is is beautiful relationship building. You get to know each other, each other's practices so much better. Well, I think because I know you, I think you are really supportive. And I think the first time we met, we talked for like an hour about like both of our art practices and where we're from. So I think you're doing a really good job already. (laughs) Chris, do you have any thoughts about about that? Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, just having conversational spaces for it. um, Sometimes it's like hard, like being in academic spaces. especially for people who did really poorly in school. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and sort of just kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's cool. Like, stuff like this, it, it's so loose. Um, it feels really good to be able to um, share ideas and uh, sort of be able to have conversations, like, now or, you know, after or, you know, uh, through email, you know, now that <clears throat> the internet is sort of a conversational space and, is sort of like kind of a, a weird ocean in itself that's problematic in ways, but um, yeah, that's yeah, that's how I feel. It's a conversation. There's another, there's another question over here. Hello, everyone. That was an amazing panel, Miigwech. Thank you so much for all of your words and your stories. Um, Dana, you're awesome, I love you. <laughs> Um, so my name is Ryan Chartrand. I'm the curator of Indigenous Art at McMaster Museum of Art. And I'm very honored to be here. And I'm also a member of the board for the ACC. And so my question 
is more to how we as the ACC, and more specifically in my role as a curator, can support you as artists. And, and, and coming more to what you were talking about around this caretaking, what, what is needed? And, and I bring this up because Quill and um, Camille have actually been developing a program for the ACC around, um, what is it called exactly? Curating care. Curating care. There you go. Um, so I'm just curious in terms of what we can do as curators, because this is something I think a lot about in terms of how I work with artists, how that relationship uh, starts before, during, and after the curatorial process, how to always loop back and check in, and, and their emotional state throughout the whole process. So I'm just, if you could generously offer some words of how we could do better in terms of our care as curators for you as artists working through a process with us. <laughs> um, I would say one thing would be like ask us like um, where we're at and like a mode, our best mode of communication. Like I fucking hate talking on the phone. Like especially with curators where they're, sorry, that sounded bad, but like, you know what I mean? Like where it's like, <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> but I don't know, I sometimes feel like it's like where it's kind of like going through it and like I get it. But also that do that doesn't work for me brain-wise. Like I won't absorb all of that through chatting if it's through the phone. Like I'm usually, I'll, I would be driving or I would be working as well. Like I'm so busy that sometimes I feel like if you ask like, um, you know, maybe could I text you but like an hour before I call you or like can I, like is email work better for you or does it really just work better if we just caught up once a fortnight like in person? You know what I mean? Like just asking how you communicate because sometimes I've found that obsessive calling, it's like like real clingy. Like, <laughs> it's, just like <laughs> it's just sometimes you're like it's okay. Like we can get all this like nailed in an hour. Like if we are in person. Yeah. But I don't know, I guess, like, I would love more of that. I would love more options. Like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's kind of, yeah. Institutional codependency is not cute, <laughs> you know? So if I don't answer your email and I don't answer your Instagram DM and I don't answer your Facebook Messenger, like, it's safe to say that, like, I'm checked out. And it's not for lack of, you know what I mean? I feel, I feel this question. I know I'm just a... A moderator, but I feel this question so strongly as also as a board member because it's this is so important. Like ask to ask, and I think consent is super important. That is sometimes lost because like here we are, we're like so humble to have this show. Oh, thank you for doing that for us. But actually, like you know, I gotta fucking watch my, I gotta, I gotta like clean my gitch and like feed my cats and like you know pay my rent also, right? So it's like that kind of like her constant harassment really adds to the anxiety. But I think that also speaks to like the trajectory of capitalism and like where it's going and like the actual modes. What can we actually do? What is like, what are we actually physically able to do um, and commit to? Because so often I feel like it maybe is fr from something that I heard before, but it's like this, um, oh shit, I just lost it. It was right there and I lost it. Okay, I'll figure it out after. Um, speaking towards like specifically queer indigenous art, um, we need space, we need consistency, we need, I, like I organized this one big event and then the question was like, oh, are you gonna do it again next year? And I'm kind of like, we don't need it next year, we need it right now and we need it like in a stream. It doesn't have to be a big annual symposium, it can be these smaller engagements that have different points of access for a bunch of different people. So like thinking more about planning for that kind of capacity. Like, I don't think it was particularly healthy to turn an event that big around in four months. I was so, like, I remember, uh, I don't know where Vanessa is, but Vanessa was like, Wes, have you taken a couple of days off? I was like, no, and she's like, go take some days off. <laughs> <laughs> so that helps too, like having someone just be like, hey, you've been working really hard, like, go chill for like five minutes. <laughs> Um, sorry, I'll say something really quickly. I think um, investing in artists without making them feel like you've taken a risk is really important mm. to the way that artists feel. Um, because artists often feel like, uh, like we should be really thankful that we're getting a slot in a show. Um, 
I can I can only talk to like an Australian experience, but because most of our exhibitions in large institutions are at the helm of government funding, I understand that there are KPIs. Um, but I think uh, you know if you're talking to an artist, you you should really be investing in that relationship and making them feel like this is almost a collaborative thought process. I also think thinking of an artist beyond one exhibition is really important because you know an artist doesn't just come alight in your show and then die after that. Like they're constantly evolving. As are you as a curator? So I just I just wanted to say that this has just been such a pleasure to listen to you all talk and and get to know some of the I, actually I think you're the only one I don't know up there but I love your work Chris and I just like I really feel like I had soul food today mm. that you really you really really get <laughs> I'm feeling your emotions <laughs> Miss Hannah <laughs> but you know you go to a lot of talks, especially in this room here, and they're not indigenous based. The thing that um, friends of mine and family said at the, at the reception, the opening was how decolonized the art show is in a very colonial space and thinking about how that was a courtroom, that was a court building at one time that judged us and probably hung about a bunch of our people. Mm -hmm. And then listening to this panel, because I've missed, I missed most of yesterday, and, uh, but just thinking about how when we bring these powerful energies of indigenous arts uh, and artists together where we can actually really talk about our practice and project that out to an audience, uh, a mixed, audience of different cultures. It's just like, I feel like I've waited a long time to see this. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Cease. That's all, folks. <laughs> Get you, me, bitch.